With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. Ah, uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, she was literally the very first guest we ever had when we went to the daily radio program. She was the first guest we ever had. Been way too long. We've got her back. Jenny Coulter, how are you, my friend? I'm doing just great, and I am so flattered that you actually wanted me to come back. Ah, nonsense. You're one of the best. Uh, she does election stuff. She does it inside and out. She's also just a really, really talented writer and a really good friend, and we're always happy to talk to you. Um, unfortunately, it's that time of the year again, so more elections. <laughs> Did we learn anything? I know we talked about things like election security. I know that got abused in a lot of ways. I know it didn't get talked about in some ways that it needed to. 2020 to now, and we're getting ready to go to the boost. You know, early voting will be starting here real soon in a lot of places. Have we actually learned anything, do you think? Okay, from a strictly technical perspective, yes. One of the things that um, CISA, which is the Center for um, Internet Security, et cetera, of the federal agency, they actually gave the election community a considerable amount of kudos because there have been far fewer data breaches and ransomware attacks than there were even two or three years ago. So the election community has taken their um, security suggestions to heart. A lot of places now actually have a cybersecurity or at least a better IT department. And I think things are moving in the right direction. Are they perfect? No, but they're getting better. Now, when you say better, though, like you just said, there's layers to this. There's the security part of it. There's the technical side of it. There's how the election, you know, people think elections, you really know the nuts and bolts of how it gets done, how it's managed, how it's handled. That's not the part that people talk about because they just want to talk about the results and that part of it. You've mentioned, you know, on the ground, the nuts and bolts stuff, that's going really well. How about that discourse side of it? Is there things that we need to do to talk about it more? Because like you said, you know, the, things are better. You don't really hear that in the media or social media all that much. So should we do a little bit better job with the discourse surrounding elections, do you think, then? I certainly don't think that would hurt. Now, one of the things I said security was getting better from a technical perspective. From a chain of custody perspective, there have been multiple uh, high-profile incidents that shall be that shall live in infamy and there were pieces of equipment systems that were accessed without proper authorization and in some cases nobody knew where that equipment went for days weeks or in some cases months that's a problem because you have to be able to trust the machines or the systems you're using and if it's just been out of sight for six months and you get it back I don't care how many inspections you do. I'm still going to be paranoid that there's a rootkit in there somewhere. Yeah. And talk about that for a minute, um, because this is like if you watch a crime show, they talk about chain of custody for evidence. They've got to know where these machines are at all the times. They got to know everybody that does and doesn't touch them. I know we've got investigations going on in Georgia now where we've got it on video. People basically tampering with stuff. We have things in other places, Arizona, where they talk about these machines, people that aren't authorized to touch them on a practical level without getting into all the you know the nomenclature of it why is it such a big deal that chain of custody because like you said you don't trust it but what would really happen if people and i'm not talking about the cranks and the crazies if most of the voters started questioning where their votes were going because the machines have been tampered with the damage it does to voter confidence is incalculable and Again, you don't know if you don't know what has happened to your machine, if you do not know where it is at all times, or at least how well this how well it's been secured, it's going to cause doubt in the entire process. And that's a justifiable doubt. And it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter whether or not you found something. That's great if you did. However, the way that certain people went about it with the breaks in the chain of custody and the complete and total lack of legal accountability and responsibility for the equipment that's what the problem is yeah and the key word there was justified so let's just go right there 
what is a justified concern because we have the the crazy theorists we have the people who ha- know nothing about elections doing election audits which we'll get into that in a minute but what would be a justifiable concern not just oh i saw somebody move a box on a grainy video what would be something that folks would need to look into any form of unauthorized access or access after hours anybody who does not have access privileges suddenly accessing something. Um, the principle of least privilege is certainly a very important part of elections. There's certain, you know, you need some things like separation of duties. You don't want one or two people in total control of the machines without an extremely well defined chain of custody document. Yeah. And the part of this, too, Jenny called to join us. The thing that really um, confuses folks, too, is there's only so many election experts. So how many people, when you're doing this at a polling place or between polling places where these machines get, you know, collected either by the state or the local authorities or whoever's watching them, talk to people about this part of it. How many people are actually professional election people? How many are like state and local officials? And how many people are just volunteers that are doing it like a poll worker or somebody who's tasked to do this, who's just a volunteer? Um, there's about um, 10,000 unique election jurisdictions so let's say about 10,000 election officials, and then um, let's ballpark maybe 30, 40,000 for staff. The remainder would be volunteer poll workers, and sometimes they're state or county employees. You know, if you're if you're short on poll workers, you can always commandeer people from the local government. So that would be about oh maybe 1.1, 1.2 million. So the vast majority of election security, at least on election day, falls to the poll workers who are tasked with conducting the election. But that that number is just blowing me away because we're talking about 154 million people voted in 2020. And there's about 260 odd million who are registered to vote. You know, so, you know, my math's not super great, but that's, you know, low 60s on vote on turnout. And you're talking about 10,000 people really controlling the results of all of that. That, that. That's a staggering ratio to people to hear the numbers that way. But that's how this works. Well, I mean, the poll worker to voter ratios, it's, I always like to point out, there are a lot more of you than there are of us. We apologize for the line. But if you were at a restaurant or Disneyland, you wouldn't be complaining. It's only when you're, it's only on election day that this suddenly becomes an issue. Yeah, and Disney World has 80,000 people just for comparison there. Uh And their own police department. And their own police department, and their own fire department, and their own production staff, and their own everything else. Is is that something that should be looked at? Is the volunteer system holding up, or is it antiquated? Is the way we're using volunteers and kind of a slapdash different way of getting poll workers? We know the folks are dedicated. We know they do good work when they do it. Is it just getting too big for them? That's kind of the accusation that gets thrown at them is like, look, you know, we're, we're creeping up on 160 million voters. We're going to need more than, you know, 10,000 volunteers here. What, what do we say to folks that's like this whole thing, we need a different system or do we just need a better system? Elections would collapse without the extremely dedicated service of American poll workers. I mean, literally. Without them, there are no elections simply because there are not enough qualified people to go around. And a good poll worker, quite honestly, there are some who are better than a lot of election officials. So as long as you retain your good election workers, I mean, things can actually, things go pretty well. I mean, certainly everybody ages and certain processes that might have been in vogue one year aren't from one year to another. But overall, I think most poll workers do a good job. I do wish that there were some form of accountability for when there's a mistake that's made that is so egregious it makes the six o'clock news, but not necessarily in a punitive me- manner, just a, look, you did this, you messed up, please don't ever do this again, and let's move forward. And that brings it to us is like, okay, you said these things need accountability, we're big on accountability. Who is holding these things accountable? Not internet sleuths watching the grainy video, not not that stuff, but in a good system where things are running well, where the mistakes are just honest mistakes. Somebody just, you know, 
you know, stuff happens. These things are complicated. There's a lot of people, chaos, things happen. There's processes for these things happen. Talk about the accountability that is built into the system when it's running correctly, because there is layers and there is ways to fix mistakes and there is a right and wrong way to do this stuff, right? Yes, there is. And ultimately, accountability stops with the voters. I am 100% accountable to the voters of my jurisdiction. And if I mess up, I may have something I did may have caused a problem for them. That's not okay. So I try to make sure that every time I'm processing a voter that I have exhausted every possible avenue of being able to help them. And believe me, that has involved some very, very long phone calls. I think that for the most part, poll workers do a great job. I think there are some, let's face it, insider threats are a thing and they've becoming, they're be it's becoming more and more of an issue, I think, particularly this year. So I think that you, especially for senior poll workers, you want to keep an eye on who your people are and you want to make sure that they're not accessing anything that they shouldn't be accessing and that they are following all the rules in accordance with the laws of the jurisdiction. Yeah, Jenny Coulter joining us. We're going to take a quick break, come back. We're going to talk about that insider stuff because she doesn't just talk about this as an analysis. She has spent many, many a day in the polls, running the polls. She's going to take us inside of it, how that works, and some of her concerns for these upcoming midterm elections in 2022. One of our great friends, and we're going to continue with her right after this. More election stuff with her as her tell continues. Uh, welcome back to Hertel. Our good friend, Jenny Coulter. Love having her. An election expert, both theory, both advocating. She also actually runs polling places, so she knows how these things work. Let's go there. Take us inside the polling place, because like you said, the insider part of this is becoming a problem. We see the news headline in Georgia now where they're investigating, where they've, you know, they got video now where election officials let people into the rooms where they shouldn't have been and people were able to fiddle with things. We just said it. There's a volunteer process here. They kind of take who they can get to try to run these things. There is untoward folks that are looking to abuse and take advantage of that, isn't there? I think so. But one of the things that with a lot of the um, insider threats, they don't believe that they're the threat. And for the most part, they did their jobs pretty well. It's just something caused them to lose faith in the process. And they may or may not have been talking to people and somebody said something that they had enough working knowledge of to be able to go, wait, that makes sense. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not, but that's kind of beside the point. They believe they're actually trying to save democracy. They're not openly trying to subvert it, even if that's what their actions wind up doing. Yeah, but here's the problem. The rules are the rules. Yes, they are. So <laughs> how do you hand, you know, you're a poll, you're in charge of a polling place and you wind up with one of these people who, you know, maybe they legitimately think there's an issue where there isn't one. You've still got rules to enforce. Um, this is kind of this is kind of unprecedented for a lot of people because they've just never occurred to them that there would be a problem in a polling place like this. What do you do? You're in charge of the poll worker. You run into one of these individuals. They start demanding to see something or they want an accounting or something or they get on their cell phone with somebody, whatever the case may be that we've seen. How do you handle it? Well, there's different pr procedures for a poll worker versus a poll watcher. Poll watchers are election observers, in some cases um, appointed by political parties. Um, poll workers are the ones that are actually doing the grunt work. So with a poll watcher, you have to establish the rules up front and you have to, I mean, in my case, I do kind of establish dominance because the first thing I do is I ask to see their ID. And they always kind of look at me and I go, well, if my voters have to show an ID to vote and I had to show an ID to get appointed as a poll worker, then I don't think it's an unreasonable request. That usually puts them at ease somewhat because it, I'm somebody to be, to be taken seriously. 
And then you have to lay out the rules ahead of time. You are not allowed to speak with the voters. If you have any questions, please direct them to me. And if you're gonna talk on your cell phone, please take the call outside. And if you keep the rules simple, generally people follow. And if they have a question, if it's a good faith question and you can answer it accurately, answer it. Treating everything like it's this shadowy secret cabal does not do anybody any favors. Now with poll workers, it's a little different because again, they are beholden to a set of laws which poll watchers are not. So you again have to establish your dominance and you have to make sure that everybody is clear on the rules, both at training and at the little, when you're swearing everybody into the oath right before the polling place opens. You know, you always do reminders. And if you see something going on that's, you know, you're, you're kind of like, oh, wait, what are they doing? You very gently take them by the side and you go, look, I know you, and I appreciate everything you're trying to do. However, what you're doing is going to cause a problem and it could potentially cost either the voter their vote or it could make us look really bad in front of an observer. Neither one of those is something we wanna be dealing with. We do not wanna be on the six o'clock news. So I'm going to politely ask if you would not do that in the future. Now that's in the polling places. People are concerned now because there are people who, um, whatever terminology you wanna use, uh, conspiracy theorists, election deniers, whatever you wanna say, there are people running who think the 2020 election was not on the up and up, that wasn't fair, that are now running for things like secretary of state positions, like other positions, because every state's a little different positions where they're going to have a say over the election process. How concerned should people be when you get somebody who uses that kind of rhetoric and they get in a position of elected power where they're over charge of these systems, either at a state level, local level, whatever the case may be. Is it a concern? How much damage can they really do? And how much of it is just rhetoric and the system can kind of bulwark itself? Some of it depends heavily on the, the surrounding power structures. Now, in Secretary of State, some Secretaries of State have, you know, like in the movie Aladdin, phenomenal cosmic power. Others, it's more of a ceremonial role. Just It just depends. But a Secretary of State that does not fulfill their duties can do an extreme amount of damage. I've seen it, I'm from California. We had one period in the mid aughts where we were going through secretaries of state like the band in the movie, This Is Spinal Tap was going through drummers. I'm not kidding. So I've seen what a ineffective secretary of state can do. And the thing is, it's not an easy job. It's You're not just overseeing elections. You have to do things like, I mean, you're in charge of the archives, the, the state seal, business licensing. There's a lot of different duties that you're expected to perform. Elections are almost ancillary in a lot of ways. And if you cannot handle those other duties, you're not generally going to last too long as Secretary of State. Yeah, and we've seen things like the situation in Arizona. Um, now we've got this investigation going on in Georgia. How much does it overshadow an upcoming, you know, we're still talking about the 2020 election now, and here we are getting ready to start doing voting in 2022. So, you know, two years worth of this now. And I imagine we're probably going to have some kind of mess out of this one way or the other that we either can or cannot predict. Why, why is there just some folks that no matter what they're, I get that you lose and you don't want to lose in this sort of thing, but the integrity of our election is just way too important to give into these folks, isn't it? Some people, no matter what, are just going to be hell bent on playing archaeologist. There is nothing you're going to be able to do about those people. You, I mean, the best thing, honestly, to do is smile, nod, and be like, thank you very much. I will take this under advisement, but we have an election coming up now. So what did we learn from the prior election that we can apply to this one coming up in the future? The thing about that is, I think that's a great way that you just put it. They want to be an archaeologist. You know, it, it's like the conspiracy. Theory. They always want to know the one thing nobody else knows, and they're going to figure it out thing. Have we lost the communal aspect to elections here? I know it's adversarial. I know we want our team to win over the other team. I get all that part, too. Is there just a civic level of this? And you're in the polling places, so, you know, you tell me, but I, by far, I've had very positive experiences in my polling place with one exception. Um, 
I think people just go there to do their civic duty. I I know that's you know cliche, but I really I I still see that a lot when I go to a polling place. Do you see that, or do you see more and more divide when you see the, just the poll people coming to the polls filing by you in the polling place? The vast majority of the voters I encounter really do vote because it is a social aspect. It's like government is one of those, it's just another word for one of those things we do together. That's the best way I can consider elections. I mean, it really is because, you know, you're voting with your friends, your neighbors, your family. It really becomes an event. Now, I don't get to partake in this. I have to vote by mail because obviously I'm at the polling place, but, you know, whatever. So I think that in certain areas, yes, voting does have more of a communal aspect. There are some areas where it's not. And I think sometimes those areas or places where there has been a really drastic change in a very short amount of time, I think that that's where things start to start simmering under the surface and eventually, hopefully not, but they do sometimes boil over. Yeah. And I mentioned, I wanted to ask you about this because we've talked about it before. Um, you were gracious enough to have me join you on a call about this. The one bad experience I've had at the polling in the last was because I had an accessibility issue. Um, I had just gotten out of the hospital. I needed to use the ADA station because I needed to, it was the one place where you can sit down and vote. You don't stand and vote for that. Um, the poll worker just wasn't using their brain and they're like, you can't take a bag. And I finally pulled my shirt up. I'm like, it's a J tube. It's surgically attached. I cannot put this down. <laughs> You know, stuff like that. But I bring that up because of this. There was a lot of things that was changed because of COVID and people can have their opinions about a lot of them. But one thing that it did do was we opened up a lot of accessibility to people that had not previously been there because now everybody's got an accessibility issue one way or the other. Right. How important is it for us to take good lessons from the COVID voting, which was chaotic, we know, but it also had some innovation to it and also had some accessibility stuff that kind of pushed the ball forward on things that have been problems anyway. Um, I know people have strong opinions on things like voting by mail and things like this, but we've seen it now. How much of that is actually also getting more people in, involved in the voting process and good parts that we need to keep from what we learned from that time period? Bottom line, voter turnout is up and it doesn't matter if you are affiliated politically or unaffiliated. People are voting. I think that's a good thing. I think that there were certain innovations that got introduced during that time period that, I mean, seriously, elections were done a huge solid. And I think one of the other things that it threw into sharp relief was the need for funding for elections offices. Uh, there's been, obviously, certain camps have been complaining that um, private enterprises were providing funds to election offices. And although, again, I realize that that can be perceived as a conflict of interest, I also realize election offices are horribly, horribly neglected when it comes to funding. And that should have been a wake up call that maybe there needed to be a little bit more money in the general fund that went to election offices. Yeah. And for folks that don't know, because, again, you've been a local poll worker for a long, long time, the actual setup, the teardown, because usually these are in, you know, schools or churches or a municipal building or places like this. Um, so it's not an overhead thing. But for folks that just don't know, how do an actual election, how does it get funded? How does the volunteers get set up? Just the mechanics of that. Just take people inside that for a minute, because a lot of people just show up and vote and they know there's volunteers and they know, well, somebody had to prep the room, for lack of a better term. But explain that process for folks a little bit. Well, after the election is called and you go through the candidate, um, the signature verification petition processes and filing deadlines, the election office has the unenviable task of finding polling places. Nobody ever wants to be a polling place. You do not get compensated the amount that you can usually charge people. And it is basically like seating control of your facility to a very elaborate destination wedding with anywhere from oh, 600 to 5,000 people. And 
you have no control over anything and you have to and you're not getting paid what you're you're not getting paid what you would normally charge somebody and you can't even access the facility because it has to be locked down because of election equipment so i can so finding polling places there's a lot of places that we loved having as facilities and they just did not want us back yeah my uh, polling place right now is actually the rec center that's attached to the elementary school and it's it's basically perfect because they they kind of design it for things like that so that works out well but especially when you get into uh in cities in rural places where there's only so many buildings that you can run a couple hundred people through for a day this is actually a really big issue that doesn't get talked about enough is like look there's only so, so many ways you can do an election and getting a building is kind of the base model of like, well, none of this other stuff works if we don't have a proper polling place. And then people don't really talk about it. No, and everybody always thinks because the polling places got closed, it was some nefarious pot. 99% of the time, it's just because they couldn't secure the facility. Yeah, secure the facility, manning the facility. There's a lot of nuts and bolts to this. We talked about the lessons learned in the last few years. We know there's going to be untoward actors that are going to claim whatever they're going to claim about this one coming up. Give people one or two things to look for in the news coverage of the elections, not the results, not the horse race stuff, but how it's actually going. Um, if a if a result gets delayed, if something happens, what's some of the things you watch for in the headlines to know like, hey, there may be a problem here besides just counting votes as we go into the election season? First thing I look for is ballots behaving badly, AKA ballots that have some sort of readability issue or errors because a poorly printed ballot or a poorly designed ballot, well, you know what a hanging chat is. So ballot, so ballot issues are the first thing I'm going to be looking for. The second is if there were any technical issues or you had problems where the facility lost power. That happened to me in the last election, it was fun. There are poll workers who were did not receive the, the amount of training they needed and had issues with equipment operation. I'm definitely going to be looking out for incidents involving potential improper access or if so, or somebody calling trying to call in a threat. I do worry about the safety of everybody. I mean, for the most part, everybody's really nice, but you, you, I've I've had my share of people who were a little um, vehement. I should I suppose. And if there's a delay with the results, usually it's because one of the polling places had to go over time because something wasn't adding up or they couldn't find something. And obviously, you can't release results until everybody's brought them in. Yeah, Jenny called it. All right, this is a serious topic, but I want to end on a bit of a lighter note. I voted in my primary. And when I went to vote, I not only did not get my I voted sticker, which angered <sighs> me greatly. They gave us you voted pins. Nice. And they were the I voted pins. I voted 2021. So not only did I not get my sticker, I wound up with a pin from the previous election. Validate my anger because this very much upset me. Dude, you wound up with a pin. I would not complain. I am an election pin freak. It's a pin from 10 to 20. It, I've got two now from 2021. At least give me a 2022 pin. Uh, you know, but it was bad enough. I didn't get my, I, I, just, I just want my sticker. Just give me my sticker. You know what? There's actually an organization called the Voter Sticker Project, and you might be able to tweet them and they can they can hook you up. Yeah, all right. I had to do that. But I, I was like, what do you mean I don't get a sticker? And they're like, no, nah, here's a pen. I'm like, what is this pen stuff? But that goes to the, you know, there really is a civic ritual element to this. And I know it's silly about the stickers and people put them on their social media and people even make fun of people for putting them on their social media. But you get you get used to wanting stuff. See, she's got hers right. I'm surprised you don't have a tattooed on, frankly. But um, hey, I probably gave you an idea. But but that you know, as silly as that is, that that goes to show that this is a civic ritual and there is a connection to this stuff, and it is important to people. Little things like that. Oh, running out of stickers that can literally cause a riot in the polling place. It's I mean, people get really testy. It's almost as bad as when Walmart uh, runs out of bags at the cash register. But we'll talk about that story some other time. Where I was work, uh, I was working for a shipping company. They're like, "We need you to bring a pallet of bags from one Walmart to another." And we're like, "We don't do that." And they're like, "Well, if you don't, there's going to be a riot." Like literally, people were just throwing stuff in shopping carts and running out the doors. Like, we got to get bags. So no stickers at the polling places is a bad thing. If you go to a polling place, make sure you get a poll worker 
as good as our friend Jenny Coulter. We love having you on to explain these things so good that even I can understand them. Uh, we love following you on social media. That's how we got to be friends. Let folks know where they can follow you and what you got going on. Now that you got the swanky set up that you've got going on behind you there, let folks know what you've got going on until we get you back again. All right. So on Twitter, if you want to follow me personally, you can follow me at Election Babe. Or if you want to follow me on my official accounts, because I am the Senior Director of Stakeholder Relations for the OSET Institute and the Trust the Vote Project. And you can follow me there at Trust the Vote. And you can follow me at OSET, O-S-E-T. Yeah, and they've been doing really good work. Very interesting stuff, innovative stuff, uh, things that are coming up. Um, things like accessibility issues and other things. Make sure you're checking out their work. My friend, uh, you were our first guest. You were our first guest when we switched to the daily radio show. We're going to keep having you back because you do that good of work, and we always appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Well, I had a wonderful time, Andrew, and thank you so much for having me. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And may the magical ballot fairies be with you. <laughs> always, because it doesn't get done without them. <laughs> Talk soon. <laughs>